Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. Yes, of course, they're serious. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Brian Auten and I'm joined by Chad Gross. How are you, Chad? No, I'm doing well. The weather, the weather is beautiful today. My wife's birthday, actually, interestingly mm. enough, is tomorrow oh. on uh, Good Friday. Yeah. So uh, that's the first time it's ever happened that I remember. Yeah. And so uh, guess what she wants to do for her birthday? I have no idea. She wants to do she wants to do yard work. She wants to fix up the yard. That's what she wants to go out and buy flowers and fix up the yard. And, and you know, I don't know. I mean, anybody that knows me knows that I absolutely detest yard work. <laughs> uh, oh, nice. I, 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 I think that if I were rich, most people would be thinking I can buy a Lamborghini now or. I can buy that house I've always wanted up on the hill. Me, I'd be thinking, I can hire somebody to do the stinking yard work because I hate it. You mean like a slave, Chad? <laughs> no, I don't mean a slave. You know, your Bible condones slavery. It, it, no, it promotes, endorses, and condones it. We're going to talk about that today, and I hope by the end of the podcast that our listeners will see <laughs> that while that can be a whipping stick that skeptics use against the Bible and Christianity, if you take a more open-minded, charitable view of it, there are actually some good answers to that claim. Yes. Right. So you want to hear what I'm reading this week? I do. Well, I should say what I finished reading this week, Peter J. Williams, Can We Trust the Gospels? And man, yes. I love that book. Love it. So clear, so simple, lots of great insight, easy to follow. And my number one recommendation right now for, you know, gospel reliability, Peter J. Williams. I, I like him just flat out as a New Testament scholar and as a scholar in general. Yeah. Can We Trust the Gospels by Peter J. Williams? That's my recommendation of the week. Excellent. I finished Alistair McGrath's biography of C.S. Lewis. Oh, it was it was really interesting. And uh, those who are uh, Lewis fans who have not read it will get a lot out of it. I definitely learned some things about C.S. Lewis that I did not know and uh, about uh, some of his uh, proclivities, I guess you could say, before he was a Christian uh, that were surprising. Also, is a bit about his relationship with Tolkien and, and how all that played out and the Inklings and some of the kind of urban legends that grew up around some of that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, it was a good read, but now I'm actually probably about 75% of the way through Hollywood heroes mm -hmm. by Frank Turek and Zach Turek, uh, how your favorite movies reveal God. And I got this really cool promotional pack in the mail. It was this little blue box and it said, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's coming soon on the top. And when you opened it, the book was in there, but it had candy, it had popcorn, and it had different like little discussion questions you could use when you were watching the films that it covers. But it was one of those books where I just thought, eh, this will be an easy read and didn't really have any, not necessarily high or low expectations. It was just like, mm, I'll give it a whirl. And man, it, once I got into it, it, it's really good. It, there's a chapter in there about Har Harry Potter. And uh, he, they actually make the claim in there, I thought this would be interesting to you, that Harry Potter actually is parallels Jesus more than any other character in literature. Wow. That's what they argue. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and they argue that in the chapter. And I told Emma, my daughter, who is a huge fan of Harry Potter, she's read all the books. She's watched, she's in the process of watching the films. I think she's on the fourth one or something. And she's a big fan. And, and I told her that after I read that chapter, it actually made me want to maybe read the books because mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever told you, but I tried to read Harry Potter and I got about halfway through the fourth book and I just kind of felt like I was reading the same book over yeah. and over again. <laughs> and so and but I'm not a big fiction reader, which I need to improve on. But yeah, Hollywood Heroes, it's such a neat way to weave the gospel and gospel truths throughout the stories that these films tell. Yeah. And it was, it's different than I thought it would be because I thought it would be more explicit, but it's a lot more thoughtfully and artfully done than I anticipated. Hmm. 
And it's not – now, I will say I, – I think it's important to say that it's not a lot of apologetics being done. There's a bit in, the, in there about the moral argument, and there's a bit in there about the deity of Christ. And, you know, Frank Turek is is very well known for having those pithy little sayings, and he drops a lot of those sayings throughout the text. But it's just a great way of just spelling – using these literary characters and film characters – to teach the gospel in a way that maybe somebody could hear it afresh. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I didn't get a promo pack, I guess. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you, man. I, I can send you some Starburst. I mean, What is that? It's a plane. What's it doing here? I think it's a mail plane. <laughs> First, let's go to the question. You said crossing the streams was bad. You're going to endanger us. You're going to endanger our client, the nice lady who paid us in advance before she became a dog. So in this case, the streams are Calvinism and Arminianism. And my question is, uh, the the crossing of the streams yields provisionism or Molinism. So my question to you guys is actually, what's the difference between provisionism and Molinism? I've been listening to, to Dr. Leighton Flowers lately. And uh, William Lynn Craig and Tim Stratton, and my head's going to explode because I don't know which one to, to use. So I just wanted to ask you guys to see if you guys knew, like, which one should I go for and what are the differences? Uh, I've been listening to you guys for a while. Thanks so much, uh, both of you. Uh, this is Joe. Anyway, uh, I got a bunch of Bitcoin you can buy if you want to. <laughs> Never mind. Forget about that. Thanks. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's just as funny the second. I think it's the third time I've heard it. It's just as funny. I love it. I know. Classic. Thank you, Joe, for the question. We've been waiting to play that for for a while now uh, because we've had other interviews and then we'd forget. And then we were trying to contact the best and brightest to help us answer because, you know, we wanted to give you. 50% better quality answers. So I can't guarantee that other than we tried 50% harder. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that was a, that was awesome. Yeah. Well, crossing the streams, we, we don't recommend that, but you know, in this case we went right to Egon that, I mean, Tim Stratton to ask it would be, if it would be okay on this occasion. So here's Tim Stratton's reply. Hey, Joe, this is Tim Stratton. First of all, I just want to thank you for listening to my stuff and, you know, watching the videos on YouTube or reading the blogs, whatever you're doing, reading my book. Thank you for uh, checking my stuff out. To answer your question, you know, whether you should be a provisionist or a Molinist, um, you can be both. The two views are not mutually exclusive. In fact, Leighton Flowers, I think it would be accurate to say that he considers himself to be a mere Molinist. If he doesn't, he's quite open to it. And in fact, I just discussed this with him today. He says uh, he doesn't see any contradiction between the two views. So if you like provisionism and you like Molinism, well, I just want to encourage you to be both. You can do it. So uh, yeah, thanks again for uh, asking the question. Let me know if you have further questions. Thanks. Bye. Well, that was Tim Stratton. And for those who are listening, um, we interviewed Tim Stratton on Molinism on uh, episode 031 of the podcast. So I would direct our listeners to go there if you're curious about what that is. But it has to do with God's foreknowledge, his middle knowledge, and how that might relate to areas of his sovereignty and man's free will, how we reconcile them. And I think Joe's question basically is looking at you know, how does that relate to issues of soteriology or the area of theology having to do with salvation? And for those interested, uh, Tim's book, Dr. Stratton's book, is called Human Freedom, Divine Knowledge, and Mere Molinism, a Biblical, Historical, Theological, and Philosophical Analysis. And he's also recently released a study guide that goes with that uh, that he co-authored with uh, Timothy Fox, and that's called Human Freedom, Divine Knowledge, and Mere Molinism Study Guide. So if you want to dig in deeper, there you go. Great. Well, earlier, Chad, you were talking about how if you won the lottery, you know, you wouldn't buy a fancy car or whatever. You, you, you would go out and you would hire someone to do your yard work. and Correct. You know, and it's sort of slave labor. 
if I if I understood you correctly. Um, <laughs> How is that slave labor? What are you talking about? I know. Well, this person's def- offering a service, and I'm saying you have a lawn service. I will give you money to come do my lawn. That's not slavery. I'm using the word slave in a different sense. So that oh. plays into our discussion today. That plays into our discussion today because we're going to be talking about slavery. Some objections that we hear are that the Bible promotes slavery or, or it endorses slavery or condones it in some way. Other people might say, well, it doesn't say anything against slavery and it should have. Mm. Or people might say, well, people used to use the Bible to justify owning slaves and uh, Christians own slaves. And uh, therefore, you know, whatever conclusion they want to draw from that, that makes either the Bible bad or God bad or Christians bad or So let's talk a little bit about slavery. When I think about this topic, it's one of those apologetics topics where this quote comes to mind. You know, this could be a a, a lot more uh, 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 complex. I mean, it's not just it might not be just such a simple, uh, you know. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's actually pretty descriptive of the problem. Pretty pretty complex. Lots of ins and outs. uh, What have you. That quote really illustrates to what what I was talking about a little bit earlier in the podcast, that if a skeptic is determined to use the topic of slavery as a whipping stick to the topic of Christianity or biblical authority, they can make up their mind to do that. But I think it, I think the first interview we did together was with Peter S. Williams. And mm-hmm. one of the things that he brought out in that interview was that this topic is much more complex then a lot of times Christians or skeptics are willing to admit, and it can't be looked at on a surface level. You've got to dig below the surface and see what was really going on. Yeah. I have to admit, I was not super excited about the idea of talking about slavery, but I think it's a really interesting topic after I got into it. I'm like, yeah, this there's a lot of strands here that are really interesting in looking at the culture of you know, the ancient Near East and what was going on in the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Looking at some of the stuff from Peter J. Williams was really helpful. Chad, you were looking at content from John Mark Reynolds. So mm-hmm. for our listeners, I just the background here is that we've we've looked at a few different resources and we're gonna just talk about what we've been finding as it relates to the subject. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's important is I like what you said there because you said, well, in the beginning, this really wasn't all that interesting to me, but you were willing to look into it. And that's a very noble thing to say, because if you think about it, there are topics that are skeptical friends or unbelieving friends and neighbors find to be very potent objections that are of no interest to us. For example, my wife used to have a, a friend who was very into the new age. And for me, the new age is just like trying to nail jello to a wall. Uh, as far as what is it, it depends on who you talk to, that kind of thing. And so, but looking into it, I, we went ahead and looked into it because we wanted to learn more to be able to give give a reason, right? So that's just a good lesson, I think, as far as apologetics goes, is sometimes we do have to delve into topics that may not be of personal interest, but since we're to be ambassadors for Christ, it's our duty to do so. Yeah. And, you know, and looking at the subject too is like, there are so many resources. You could look at a number of different um, things online for apologetics. Things like gotquestions.org uh, is a great resource for lots of just general apologetics or theology or Bible questions. Bethinking.org mm-hmm. is another great place. And that's where I came across a, a great lecture from Peter J. Williams, which mm-hmm. I was so happy to see because I just read his book anyway. Right. And uh, anyway, I thought, Well, let's look at the Lexham Bible Dictionary and find out what are the terms, because a lot of the times when we're thinking uh, there's an or hearing an objection about slavery, we have to say, wait, what do you mean by slavery? Because they might be thinking something like a black and white issue, a racial issue or uh, wait a minute, what, what are we talking about? Are are we talking about sex trafficking? Are we talking about coerced, terrible treatment? Are we talking modern day, olden day? And especially when we're talking about historically, you know, there's been two types of slavery. There's slavery based on economy. And then there's slavery, of course, that's been based on race. Those are uh-huh. those are very different. And so we need to make sure that we, and, and like you said, you even threw in um, the unfortunate fact of sex trafficking. 
So when that topic comes up, we need to make sure that when somebody is saying the Bible condones slavery or the Bible endorses slavery, yeah. well, what do you mean by slavery? It seems like the most common sort of mistake I think people make in, in the hand-waving objection, like the Bible condones it or doesn't forbid it. The first thing I think that's going on usually is that they have one idea of slavery from a more modern time in the past 200 years or whatever, and they look at that and they think that is the only definition or the only representation of slavery that there can be. And then they read that back on to the Old Testament or New Testament. New Testament, both of which had different sorts of things going on. So right. when we look at the objection, I think we have to say, what are you disagreeing with that was going on in the Bible? And was it the same as what you're thinking, maybe? So anyway, looking at the Lexham Bible Dictionary under slavery, it says the practice of one person owning another as property or one person owing a debt to another and repaying that debt via their labor. So even in that you you had ownership going on. You also had like a, a relationship, a power relationship. But then there was also the aspect of it, not necessarily that you're owned by the person, but you're indebted in a way and you're, you're repaying your debt with labor. It says found in the ancient Near East, the Greco-Roman world and the Old and New Testaments, no single description of slavery fits the various forms it took in the ancient world. However, it was quite different from the slavery practiced in the West during the 18th and 19th centuries. So, I mean, even just looking at the Lexham Bible dictionaries, like first thing that kind of comes up in Logos. It, it sounds to me like when you, you gave those definitions of the term slavery is, is one would be, of course, unfortunately, human beings being owned as property. But the other one you could even rightly call indentured servant. Yes. That's a big distinction there. That's a big difference. Yeah. I'm not saying that either is preferable. Uh, that's not the argument I'm making, but there's a lot more going on here in the ancient world. And we might even hopefully get to the to the question of why was there no immediate call uh, yes. uh, to abolish slavery? Because that's one of the objections that skeptics bring up, right, is, well, why didn't God say thou shalt not own slaves, period, in any way, shape or form? And so hopefully we'll get to that. But I just thought that distinction there is, is important to say that a slave is different than an indentured servant. The, one of the distinctions Peter J. Williams brings out in one of his talks and is he, he looks at how the words were used um, in the Old Testament and the New Testament when it talks about slavery. And what he was saying is that there's an overlap. You, you know how like you have a Venn diagram and you have two circles that overlap. And on one side, you could have slave and the other one would be servant. And through the translating process, it's really difficult to determine because it's the same word. So sometimes they would translate it servant. Sometimes they would translate it slave. So you could say servant of God or slave of God in another. It just depends on who translated it because right. there was and also there wasn't now it was not always a negative connotation. Like nowadays you, you hear the word slave and it's like, oh, no, it's uh, just negative. And so they separate the terms when you could have maybe use them interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, the original languages where the Bible was written, there wasn't necessarily a negative connotation tied to it. It just had a connotation of work or service. Anyway, Peter J. Williams says that uh, the meaning of the, uh, uh, there's this word ebed, which is servant, can also be translated slave. And it wasn't inherently negative and was related to work. And it just shows a person's subservience to another. Um, so, for instance, all subjects of Israel are servants of the king. The king himself is a servant of their God. So in the time of the Old Testament, no one is free. Everyone is subservient to or ebed of someone else. So he says translating ebed as slave is problematic because of its negative connotations, which were not originally there. But we associate from other historical contexts, this generally leads to an inconsistency in translation, and it becomes hard for the reader not to read into the word ideas from subsequent very different systems of slavery, like in Greece, Rome, and North America. I thought that was really helpful, because even in the translation where you might be reading slave, you're not sure if that was 
well, what was originally used and what was the connotation originally? Because sometimes the translator wouldn't, like in our English Bibles, they wouldn't cho they're choosing based upon what, well, what, who are we writing to? The audience will think if we use the word slave that we mean something bad when with a servant, or should we be more literal? You know, so there was, mm -hmm. there's translation choices. It's a little more uh, 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 complex. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, what I was thinking is that if, if slavery can be defined in different ways and someone has an objection about the Bible or God based upon slavery, then we have to know, wait a minute, what exactly are you objecting to and on what grounds? You have to accurately know what the Bible's describing before you attack it, like that quote from Pascal. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you mean owning another, exploiting another, someone, or do you mean someone who voluntarily puts themselves into an agreement? to work off their debt by being obligated to work for a household for a set period of time? Or you talk about like what you mentioned, Chad, economic slavery or racial slavery. So it can be different things. I, I think that's very key when you're looking at this topic. And I think that the Christian and skeptic alike need to be thoughtful about making sure that they're doing their due diligence to look at the context and try to understand what the text is actually talking about when it brings up this topic instead of yeah. Jumping to the jumping to the conclusion and saying, oh, well, I'm just going to pick the worst version possible to make my objection try to seem more potent. It's not just the relationship, the master slave relationship, but what what is the treatment of the said slave? What is the conditions of the said slave? And they can all vary depending on who the master is. You know, so people can have good masters or bad masters. You know, and so they, their treatment can be completely different. So if you say, well, there's three households who have slaves, one could be treated horribly, one could be treated fine, and the other one could have, soup, you know, really big privileges. Mm -hmm. So slavery doesn't immediately mean something negative or positive. You have to say, well, what were the conditions of that particular um, agreement or condition? Were they owned or did they go into it voluntarily? Did, did they stay after their time was up because they loved the household and they wanted to serve it and they had some sort of inheritance, right. you know, that they sort of earned, you know, also from the Lexham, Lexham Bible Dictionary that uh, says slavery existed in most cultures in the ancient world and in all the cultures surrounding the land of Israel during biblical times. A slave could be owned by the state, such as the publicly owned slaves in Athens who served as a police force or by individuals. The majority of slaves were prisoners of war who were sold into slavery. Slavery could take the form of debt slavery in which people sold themselves or their children to clear their debts, punishment for crime, the birth of children to slaves, and the enslavement of victims of piracy or war. Slaves in state-owned mines worked under inhumane conditions and had a short life expectancy. Many household slaves, on the other hand, fared better. So again, I think there's there's a lot of different reasons for it, a lot of different conditions that each could have to uh, read into it our common, more modern idea of what a slave is, especially the idea of a racial slave is in an accurate critique of, of what we're seeing in the scripture. In the ancient Near East, there were slaves because of being prisoners of war. Others sold themselves into slavery in order to pay their debts. Many were semi-free and worked as serfs on state and temple estates or as domestic slaves in wealthier household. Others were slaves in that stronger sense of the word, often being branded uh, to be easily identified as such, and they could be bought, sold, or transferred by inheritance. In the Greco-Roman world, owning slaves was not limited to the rich. Many households included at least one slave. Greeks and Romans both employed a system in which slaves could own property, earn money, and buy their freedom. Those who wanted skilled workers often used slaves rather than free men, thus many slaves were more economically secure than many free wage laborers. So I think that's a little bit helpful just to, just to bring the balance, not to negate or dismiss, oh, well, there was nothing bad. No, there was a lot of different situations. Right, and to be fair, what we're trying to do here is, is kind of present what often is not shared. And then, of course, too, we're taking kind of a broad view instead of looking, hey, let's look at these specific verses and exegete them. We're trying to look at a more broader view to give more, bring more clarity to the topic. 
But then also in the show notes today, I know that we're going to include a number of uh, books and resources that that will you can do that deep dig if you want to learn more. Mm -hmm. I think that it's important too to address that what you brought up in the beginning, near the beginning of the podcast, Brian, where you were talking about, well, there were people in the past who claimed to be Christians and who used the scriptures to argue and to just to argue for slavery, to justify slavery. What is Christians? What what would I say to a non-believer or a skeptic who was bringing that up? And what I would say to them is a few things. I would say, first of all, just because somebody can take something and use it for evil does not in and of itself make that thing evil. In other words, just because somebody can take the Bible, they can take verses and rip them out of context or misrepresent them and use them to justify something does not mean the Bible actually justifies that. In the same way, the skeptic would not appreciate it if I said, well, people use certain interpretations of Darwinism to justify eugenics, which that's a fact. But yeah. that doesn't mean that Darwinism naturally leads to eugenics. That's not what I'm saying. But it's it's so they wouldn't appreciate it if I did that. They would want me to understand Darwinism historically proper. And so we're just asking to, for the same shake back to try to understand what the scriptures are actually saying. And if you're going to argue that it's, it's undeniable that people use the Bible to justify slavery. Nobody's saying, oh, no, that never happened. But what I would say is, is you need to demonstrate how their interpretation was correct. Uh, yeah. Just because somebody misused the Bible, it's not the Bible's fault. It's not the yeah. fault of Christians. In the same way, a lot of skeptics would argue, and by the way, I do know people in the ID movement who have tried to make the argument that Darwinism leads to eugenics, and that is the proper interpretation. I'm just saying that I know a lot in the skeptical community would not appreciate me asserting that. They would want me to argue that. They would want me to demonstrate that. Well, I'm saying the same thing. If you're going to say that the Bible condones or endorses slavery, You've got to justify that with argument, and you've got to show how the scriptures lead to that, which I don't think you can do. You mentioned that I looked into, I found some resources from John Mark Reynolds helpful, and that was true. One of the points he makes is that the Old Testament acknowledged the existence of economic slavery in ancient times and attempted to regulate it, making it more humane, and the New Testament undermines the, the viability of all slavery calling for slaves to be treated as brothers. But it does not call for the immediate abolition of slavery, admittedly. But the point is, is that Reynolds is arguing that slavery and many other institutions would gradually disappear as the most fundamental principles of the Bible undermines them. Mm -hmm. So what was laid out over the revelation of the Old Testament and the New Testament had within it the principles that eventually led to the downfall of slavery. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, too, with Reynolds is he has an essay uh, in the Apologetic Study Bible for Students, which we've referenced before, where he offers a handful of explanations as to why the Bible didn't call for the immediate abolition of slavery or why God didn't write, get rid of the type of slavery you have right now done deal, right? One of the things he brings out is the priority of the soul. And Reynolds writes, our fallen world is full of social evils and new ones are invented every day. Scripture provides principles that when applied to specific social injustices can foster liberty and justice over time. The Bible attacks slavery and other social injustices only indirectly because its main focus is not human culture, but the relationship between God and humankind. Healing from the dying soul is prioritized over overturning corrupt social systems. Yes. What I kind of glean from that is that um, God is concerned with not writing a book to try to correct uh, man's systems, but to yeah. fix his heart. So if we think of what is slavery, well, I was thinking, I was thinking like slavery is the fruit of 
uh, fallenness, you know, wrong slavery, what I mean, like abusive, uh, I own you, I'm going to sell you, you're a commodity, you are just a tool, um, and there's no, there's no goodness there. Uh, so what I understand, like John Mark Reynolds saying that the Bible's more concerned with the root rather than the fruit. Mm. Um, and if, if God can change the root, then the fruit will change. Another thought that comes to my mind is that like, if the Bible just addressed all the outward issues, the inward ones wouldn't change. Like, how did uh, do not commit adultery work? Jesus came along and said, well, great, but don't lust in your heart. You know, it was like they were still breaking it. They he just up. weren't doing it on the outside. Right. He upped the ante. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Matthew twelve thirty three says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad for the tree is recognized by its fruit. Uh, I think that sort of principle goes in, in along with what Reynolds is saying there is that God is prioritizing the soul of man to reform that. And then from that flows change in society, exactly. change in behavior and all of that sort of thing. And you know what else, too, I think that needs to be said, and it sounds a bit cliche, but I don't mind saying it anyway, is that when you look at Christianity, and I hope I, I can articulate this well, when you look at Christianity, you have to look at the whole Christian system. In other, in other words, if you're going to look at slavery and how God revealed the Old Testament and how it was still a radical change from how things were being run, and it was still making slavery more humane than it was, right? But you also have to understand that as Christians, we view God as all wise. And one of the points that, that Reynolds brings out in his book, Against All Gods, what's right and wrong about the new atheists, because of course, slavery, this slavery topic became so popular when the new atheists started ringing that yeah. bell so much. Right. But Reynolds, Reynolds says this, he talks about how God knows that a great good must be brought about slowly. And he talks about how important it is for humanity to be part of that change. And he writes this in the book, he says, if a culture does not learn for itself what is good, true, and beautiful, then it will not be an adult culture. It will depend forever on priestcraft and develop a magical instead of a rational understanding of reality. We would be lost without divine revelation, but God is intent on giving us the time to truly understand what he is saying. He does not just force it on our imagination. And so he talks about he talks about how important it is for God reveals these principles either through scripture or written on the human heart and the importance of us being involved in this development so that we can truly become a mature society. And so when skeptics are looking at the Christian worldview They've got to keep in the keep that in the context of the wisdom of God. Maybe God, even though from our perspective, we're saying, hmm, maybe not the way I would have done it, but we don't see the whole picture. We're not all wise. We don't know all things. And so maybe there's a reason. And instead of being uncharitable and using the most uncharitable view of slavery as a whipping stick, maybe we should actually take the time to say, huh. Maybe God had a reason for doing things the way he did. Good point. And if you look at, and, and again, going through this, this brief article here, one of the things I think that Reynolds brings out that was very eye-opening to me was he talks about the pace of change. And Brian, you alluded to this a bit. He talks about how it wouldn't even have, it could have led to greater evils if God would have immediately abolished slavery. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here's Reynolds. He says this. Slavery in the ancient world was based on economic and military factors, not skin color. Defeated soldiers and bankrupt citizens often became slaves. Civilization and the hope of progress depended on highly structured, rigid social hierarchies. Greeks and Romans lacked the moral training, technological development, and economic sophistication to handle a fully free civilization. Mining and agriculture, construction, and many other basic activities depended on the labor force provided by slavery. Economic slavery is evil, but immediate abolition 
could have been a worse evil, possibly leading to violence, starvation, and total societal collapse. Overnight revolutionary change in human institutions often produces more violence than lasting peace. God understands such things. He is a good educator, and he teaches his lessons as quickly as is feasible. And so to me, again, a charitable understanding could be that God immediately upon revealing himself began to put things in place that would, elite, that would lead to the eventual abolition of slavery. But as Reynolds says, the pace of change was important. The idea of the pace of change is that I think first that God would change the heart and it would be very difficult to immediately do away with the working relationship, whether it's positive, negative, or in between. So, because we talked about, there's all these different ways that the master-slave situation could have been in, in the Bible times, right? Mm -hmm. So, when you see in Philemon, where they send uh, Onesimus back, who was a slave who ran away, but then he went back to be with his master. He's like, well, receive, he's become a Christian now. Receive him, not just, not as a slave, but as a brother. A dearly you know? loved brother. Yeah. yeah. So they sent him back and basically saying, the deal's still on. You, you know, he's coming back to fulfill his requirements. But now the relationship, the, the treatment in that relationship is different. And throughout the scriptures, there's regulations put on that. So... You talk about the Bible promoting slavery. No, it regulated it because it was part of the culture. And, and then they put caps on things. Don't treat your slaves, slaves like this. Treat them right. Treat your workers fairly. Treat the people underneath you or in your care or in your household with honor. And then if you are in that subservient role where you're the worker and you are the, the one that has to obey in that relationship, then do it as unto the Lord. It's the Lord you're serving. It's like, now we're slaves of Christ. So, you know, Paul chose the word slave because it was like, okay, now your master is the Lord Jesus, hmm. you know? So it's not necessarily a bad thing to be subservient or you were supposed to be subservient to Christ. We're all slaves of something, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, but it, I digress. But the point is that to do away with the system is secondary to the changing of the heart. Because maybe, and I'm just thinking out loud here, maybe if the heart changed, not all of the systems need to go. Maybe they just need to be reformed. Some of them need to be scrapped absolutely and completely, of course. Right. But some of those relationships, like the one where Van Lehman is going back, Paul didn't tell him to scrap the system. Because as far as I would understand it, it wasn't a, a terrible setup they had. So, Brian, I guess a good place to end would would kind of be talking about that topic of does the bible in any way promote or endorse racial slavery i i think we've done an admirable job separating racial slavery from economic slavery and slavery from what we knew in the west uh, particularly in the south and from being an indentured servant, but then what about those who still have that lingering question of, well, does the Bible condone racial slavery? And a couple, a couple of things there, one from me, one from John Mark Reynolds. And then of course I'll let you chime in. First of all, the Bible's very clear that, that God created everyone in his own image. And so a simple argument kind of follows from that is if, if God created everyone in his own image, then everyone is equal, equally valuable. God created everyone in his image, therefore everyone is equally valuable. So there is no justification um, in scripture for racial slavery. John Mark Reynolds puts it like this. He says, racial slavery finds no justification in scripture, and it is much worse than economic slavery. Race-based slavery calls into question the basic worth of people due to their skin color. Since this is plainly unbiblical, there was a much stronger argument for immediate abolition of race-based slavery, regardless of the social cost. Slavery in the United States occurred in an era when Christian principles were wide widespread, making slavery an obvious affront to moral justice. 
slavery was not necessary for sustaining 19th century social order. Indeed, race-based slavery undermined the health of the nation. So I would say race-based slavery uh, contradicts what God has revealed. And also, I agree with Reynolds that it is uh, detrimental to the health of any nation. Now, you mentioned we had wanted to point some people to some resources. What ones would you want to point people to for what you found helpful on the topic? Yeah, uh, a couple, actually. First of all, the book by Paul Copan, which listeners probably have heard of, is God a Moral Monster. He goes into this in some depth and looks at specific passages that due to time we're not going to go into today, maybe in the future sometime, Brian, we could do that. And then also God Behaving Badly by David Lamb. And that's probably a more readable, more layman version, touches on many of the same themes that Paul Copan's book does. And so those two would be specifically helpful. And then there's a couple other ones that we'll include in the show notes as well. But those are probably the two I would start with if you're thinking, well, but what about in Exodus or what about this passage? Well, the, these guys tackle those those difficult passages in depth and, and give a response to it. So uh, you'll find those helpful. Cool. Well, we'll include those in the show notes on the blog and in the MP3 metadata. Also, the Peter J. Williams uh, talk that I was referring to, I think you, you can either listen to it or watch it right on that bethinking.org website. But he basically looks at how biblical words connected with slavery in the Old and New Testament have been translated and how our contemporary understanding has changed over the years. It's really interesting and enlightening. So there's so much to cover on this. That's why I was like, got excited after I started the looking into it and um, uh, how many different strands there are mm -hmm. in involved in it. I think some of the things I take away from it are, number one, it's really important to make sure, sure that you're aware that there are different types of slavery. And the type of slavery that is referred to in the Bible is not the same kind of slavery that unfortunately happened in the South, for example. I think also it was really helpful to think about and talk about the God's priority of the soul and why he came, why he revealed himself the way he did. Also, the fact that God being all wise and all knowing may have had a very good reason to reveal things the way he did. But in that, well, of course, he did have a good reason. But I'm saying from the skeptical point of view, maybe he had a good reason, right, for doing uh, for revealing himself the way he did and putting those pillars in place that would lead to the event, the eventual abolition of slavery. And then finally, I think it's important to know that the Bible does not have any precedence or endorsement of any type of racial slavery at all. Well, I think that's all we've got time for today. So thanks for joining us for the podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This is a this is a really big topic and we have just scratched the surface hopefully given you some nuggets to think about and some resources to dig in deeper but just know that when you are in conversations with skeptics that there are reasonable replies and things that you can say to them to show them to to at least take some of the teeth out of this objection so hopefully they're more willing to look at christianity as a whole well said see you next time Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. And we also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. And please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetics stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.